Welcome to the week one recap in which the slime deck is dealt with at short pace. So this is the first chapter. This is the fundamentals, groundwork and introduction to services marketing. What we're wanting to establish by the end of this is the difference functionally as a marketer between goods and services and the requirements of services marketing as a distinct and unique approach in delivering value in the marketplace. There are a couple of elements here that need to be understood is this is foundation. So as the semester rolls on, things will expand. So things around customer service experience, the overall experience and how to use a service as, as a competitive advantage emerges over time. So first of all, there's a lot of stuff around the global services era, how services marketing and the development of the whole area as an economic powerhouse. A large portion of the economy is services driven now and there's a lot of stuff that's been invested in terms of technology being a service platform, even things like Facebook, they're services rather than goods. So the first distinction is a good has an object, a device or a thing. It is predominantly based around the tangible. A service is around deeds, efforts or performances. It may involve tangibles, but it is not dominated by them. So the car is the goods. The mechanic servicing the car requires the car to be present, but the car is not the fundamental part. The service is the deeds, the efforts and the performance. So you're looking at this also being a useful dichotomy at the starting point for thinking, but not a perpetual uh, black and white, you're either a service or you're a good. There's a lot of nuance in services marketing, particularly when we start looking at the sliding scale of tangibility. The idea here is that nothing is perfect. Nothing is completely tangible, nothing is completely intangible. And this particular aspect here, the far extremity, salt versus teaching, what we're looking for is the understanding that the majority of the value will come from the in intangible component in teaching and the tangible component in salt. There are, along the way, a sliding scale. And we put fast food outlets in the middle because what you're buying is a tangible good and the service of the preparation, the cleanup and the after effect. So in essence, instead of buying an object like a car or a soft drink, the fast food outlet buy, sells you a hybrid physical object and service object. So the idea effectively what we want to do with something like the scale of market entities is this is a way of thinking. It's a theoretical framework. The more tangible something is, the easier it is for those aspects to be emphasized in the marketing, product trials, sampling, visuals, physical evidence. The more intangible something is, the harder it is for someone to sense it, to see a preview of it, but at the same time, the lack of physical products and properties are an advantage that allow you to make use of customization, modification, the ease with which you can alter the delivery, upgrades, and never having a stockpile of old services you have to work through in order to get to the new service.
Now, one of the critical, uh, mission critical and super useful models of the semester is the seduction model. And this is the sort of thing that shows up on take home exams because what you're looking for here is a way of understanding the customer experience in marketing, in services marketing, and through that, being able to set your marketer's lens of what is the value that we're offering, what is the product we're offering, how are we going to engage. Now it consists of four parts, the service scape, the service provider, the back-end invisible systems, and the other customers. The service scape is, an import, again, another important framework that will recur. You will be encountering the service scape multiple times because this is the uh, Bittner, Mary Jo Bittner's view of how does the physical environment in which the service conducts itself influence the perceptions of the service. And service scape has elements such as the ambient conditions, what are the other objects inside the service scape, and what are the physical evidence elements, signs, symbols, artifacts? What's the visual messaging you're getting from walking into this environment? What is that helping tell you about what to expect? What, how is that framing your expectations? And how is that guiding your customer experience? The second part of the seduction model is the contact personnel, the service providers, the people of your organization and basically these are the people who do any of the roles in the service delivery so if we're looking at a dentist it's the reception team it's their support staff member it's the dentist themselves it's anyone you interact with either directly or indirectly in the service process so this makes uh, this whole approach a question of physical environment plus people from your team plus the other customers. Who else is going to be sharing the service experience with you? Now, if you take something like a dentist, it's the patients before and after you. If you're sitting in a dental lounge and the patient who's currently uh, in with the dentist is sounding like they're auditioning for a horror movie, that's going to modify your service experience whether you are comfortable with dentists or not. But for the most part, the other service, the services uh, marketing approach to other customers is that they are part of the service experience and can be on-sold or integrated into the service design as a feature. Uh, Major events, sporting events, the crowd is a feature that is on sold to other members of the crowd. Massive multiplayer games rely on other people in the environment. Even gym memberships where you're talking about gym buddies and exercise classes, these require other people. And the other people help build the service experience. The last part of the seduction model is the invisible back end. Uh, we have a framework for this, the Service Blueprint, which we will engage with a little bit later in semester. But basically, this is how the system functionally creates the service environment. It's a question of making a... If you're going to deliver a service and coming back to something like the dentist, the booking schedule, the reordering, the supplies, ensuring that the dental uh, surgery is clean and hygienic, making certain you have everything in stock. These are all invisible things that the customer shouldn't notice and tends to only notice when things go wrong. So the idea here is that there is an infrastructure within which the service is delivered. That infrastructure can inform the service scape environment and it can be designed to support customer and employee alike. The why study services marketing, uh, so start with your three weeks into a subject. Uh, secondly, you're looking at this from the point of view of it's a growth area, 
it's got a lot of the economy behind it. And also, it helps you work a skill set of your own work life is going to be most often the delivery of a service for yourself, for a customer, or to your employer. So things like the e-services, uh, where we're trying to solve a little problem of services marketing being intangible by digitizing it, or building on the advantage of services being flexible enough to be coded into software, consistency through automation. There are a bunch of different ways in which the self-service side of services is relying on technology and electronics. So, chapter two. What we're looking at in chapter two is a brief overview of the sectors of where services marketing takes place, as this will inform decisions around where could I pitch a service, where could I look to work a service, where could I find a services product to address and critique. Overall, the aim here is we also want to raise some of the stuff around ethics. We want to point to a couple of areas of interest in the service economy, but really the ethical implications are a, a critical part. So what is the service economy? It's this whole framework of, and you can see how broad this is when you've got other services, education is a critical area, government, information technology, hospitality, business, there's a whole range of different places. Of interest to us in this particular season, the government uh, and the idea of the not-for-profits, charities, federal and state governments, basically whole of government is a service, service provision. Uh, the government itself is not a tangible object. It does deal in tangible objects on a regular basis, but it itself is not tangible. It's a mutually agreed event. Uh, it's a service delivery. Even politics to an extent is services. Information-based services, uh, books are physical objects, movies are experiences, concerts are experiences. The CD or the DVD, which you never play, but you own because you needed it to complete the set, is a tangible object. But the experience of listening the experience of watching. These are intangible and these are embedded services. And this is the digitization, this is the e-service. Take a concert, record it, play it back. You are digitizing the experience. Similarly, leisure and hospitality, there's a lot of stuff here where the core service offering involves tangible objects, food and drink, but you're not fundamentally taking ownership of the skills of the employee. You go out to a restaurant, you buy the food, you don't gain the skills of the chef, you gain access, temporary access to their food, provision of their food. So this is sitting you nice in the middle of the scale of market entities when you're in leisure and hospitality, particularly leisure and hospitality based around the provision of goods as part of a service package. Professional and business, this is an area where most of us will find ourselves in. Uh, be you consultants or just employee, you're looking at this from the point of view of delivering a service product either to an employer or to a customer, or both. You are hired by an employer to deliver a service to your customers you are a service, you're part of the service process, but you're also partly delivering that service for pay to that employer. Which is why services marketing is neat, because it's one of the most embedded real life areas you'll cover. Now the catch all, everything else, um, basically there's probably a lot of uh, opportunity to expand that service economy flower to pick up some of these areas. Uh, the fact that things like repairs, servicing, these are sitting on outside the main the main set. But fundamentally services are, is that heavily embedded in the economy that there are a lot of things and it's a developing growing area. 
if there is a place that you can apply your skills that someone will pay you money or exchange you something of value for, then it covers under services. Now a quick uh, discussion of the ethics of services marketing. We'll raise these as they come across in the semester. But overall, customers are more vulnerable in the service uh, encounter. There are some areas of ethical conflict and what you need to be aware of is that ethics are in themselves a flexible uh, definition because the lack of a universal right and wrong is a feature, not a bug. But when you are looking at the service ethics and you are looking at this from the point of view of what am I doing? Is it, am I doing the right thing? We open up our ethics frameworks by looking at places where there are risks and there are opportunities for misconduct. So the first aspect that really is important here is that the four pillars uh, elements, which we go into a little bit later, the more intangible service is, the harder it is to objectively evaluate the quality of the service. And that's a twofold. You can do a service well and the customer doesn't believe that you have, or you can do a service badly. Uh, but the customer can't tell. The heterogeneity, uh, the, the lack of standardization means a lack of quality control. You can deliver a service intentionally badly to someone. Uh, but also with heterogeneity and intangibility and customer co-production, you can often blame the customer for their failure to perform. Or the customer can blame you for their failure to get the service that they didn't contribute to. And the other aspect that we've addressed across here is that human interaction is a key part of the service delivery process. So what makes the customer more vulnerable in here? The big part is it's hard to pre-search and fully understand what a service is going to be like, what the service experience will be, what the service attributes are. Uh, the more technical the service is, the harder it is to evaluate. Similarly, the, the time lapse between performance and evaluation can create some real vulnerability, particularly also for the service provider. There is an ethical element here of you can walk in, have a service that will take a few days to a few weeks to really fully vest, be it experiential, be it uh, education is the case in point, that you will find the value of your education several years after you have finished performing it, to finish training in it. So the gap between performance and evaluation can be quite severe. You can't give a service back. Uh, a poor performed service cannot be boxed up and handed back, whereas a physical good can be, which means that we now have a lower level of guarantee and warranty on the service. Variability is an acceptable part of the process, but that also means that there is the opportunity to short change to cheat your customer, to do a whole bunch of things there. And because the customer is participating in the process, there is a certain element to which are we actually taking advantage of the customer. So there's a lot of ethical issue lists um, here, figure 2.10. That's basically for you to do as a checklist to make certain that you have thought over what could come into effect. And the last sort of couple of ideas in here is that where we end up with conflicts of interest, uh, where particularly a conflict between your role as a service provider and your desire to make good for your customer and your instructions from your employee, uh, we come up against that role stress for boundary spanners a little bit later in semester. And finally, just the, uh, the actual impact factor here is ethical misconduct is bad for the organization, both for the stress it induces, but also an unethical workplace lowers the performance of the people. The people are central to the success of services. So at the end of the day, what we're looking for is services marketing is heavily dependent on people and it needs people to feel comfortable and safe in their environments where they work in order to get the best performance out of them. 
So that's the wrap for uh, the recap summary slide decks. If you need anything, you've got the platforms to contact me over email, on Twitter, with the hashtag. Uh, 